one. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Shade, for being with us and in sharing your incredible information as well as your technology. Uh, this is the, the third in the series of, of your um, one-hour webinars where you're really going into the, the nitty-gritty of mercury and mercury toxicity and, of course, by extension of that, all the other heavy metals, um, which we recognize are incredible uh, problems for not only our environment but for our personal environment. So, uh, Dr. Shade, I appreciate your in insights and your information, and please take it away. All right. You're welcome. Thank you very much for for having me uh, speak to your group. Uh, it's uh, more people I can work with, always the better. Everybody brings your unique insights. And so it's it's good to finally get, get some clarity into the mercury world. Uh, usually when I give this talk, I call it looking inside the black box because there's so much confusion uh, and, and a lot of very empirical uh, thought on it. So uh, I just want to remind you uh, that on our website, uh, behind the clinical section, if you go to either members login or, well, if you've already registered, go to the members login. Uh, and if not, you can register here. And this will bring you to a page where you put in information, much like a lot of professional websites. And uh, this will get you a, uh, this will get you uh, a login and password so that you can get into uh, the login site where we have all of our all, all of the different PDFs we have uh, uh, PowerPoint shows there's more of them going up there's videos so all of the educational material uh, is back uh, in that section so don't forget to register and you'll have lots of information at your fingertips so now getting back to uh, where we were uh, in the talk, uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, intestinal metal detox system, which is our, uh, it's also called the Clearway Detox System, and that's our approach for uh, getting mercury and other metals out of the body, but you'll see it's a cornerstone for any detoxification work that you do. Uh, I think a lot of uh, what's been conditioned, what's been called traditional detoxification is more towards uh, flushing the drainage roots and flushing the extracellular matrix. And we're going to talk specifically about cellular detoxification, or at least that's one of the aspects that's very different in this. And uh, being able to hit the triggers for cellular detoxification is the reason that we can be so successful with getting mercury out of the body where a lot of uh, traditional detox doesn't do that. Uh, so we're looking to repair and amplify the body's natural detoxification system for safe removal of mercury. So uh, when, we, when we talked previously, uh, we talked about the role of dental amalgam in uh, poisoning the roots out of the gastrointestinal system. We talked about how that leads to uh, inflammation in the small intestine, slowing down the transport proteins, which are the final uh, roots out of the body, and how that runs up the way, slows down phase two and phase three from the cells, uh, but it leaves you with an overactivation of phase one detoxification. So we want to eliminate that, free up this uh, small intestinal path, and get all of this working. At the same time, we want to uh, kickstart the activity of these transport proteins and the phase two enzymes. We talked uh, about how that inflammation in the gut will then kick a lot of the load over into the kidneys because there's a couple of doors out of the hepatocytes, and when the door to the, to the intestines is blocked, the door to the kidneys opens, invariably uh, wearing out the kidneys if this is done on a chronic scale. So you can see how chronic inflammation can overload your detoxification systems and lead to more toxicity inside the body. And that's one of the, uh, unfortunately, one of 
uh, the causes of inflammation is toxicity. So you can see a very clear downward spiral that you need to get into. So at the same time that we're opening up the, the intestinal roots, we have to be supporting the kidney roots as well. So what is it that we need for uh, mercury requirement? What are our biochemical mercury removal requirements? Well, the first here uh, is opening up of the phase three clearance, including, this is going to include intestinal binding and elimination. So because those final doors go down into the intestines, we have to ensure that they're open. And because that's a final point out, anytime you block those doors, you block all of the upstream chemistry. So opening them, getting them into the gut, and then what's traditionally viewed in uh, a naturopathic sense as a binder, you need to uh, tie up the mercury so it's not reabsorbed. Uh, then number two, we need effective GST, that's glutathione S transferase activity. These are the phase two enzymes at a cellular level that are responsible for linking the mercury to the glutathione to create that complex that is then shuttled out of the cell into the blood, out of the blood into the liver, and out of the liver into the small intestine. So open up phase three, activate phase two, and then make sure that that phase two enzyme glutathione S transferase has sufficient uh, has sufficient substrates to use. So the main substrate we're going to be looking at is glutathione. So we need intracellular glutathione sufficiency. The key here is to be able to get it into the cell. And as much as IV glutathione is, is nice for flooding the body with uh, with, with glutathione, it doesn't go directly into the cell. You have to actually have to take it apart outside the cell and reassemble it inside the cell. So we'll look at some of the tricks for getting uh, glutathione specifically inside the cell. And uh, uh, the biggest thing for us is uh, liposomal or nanosphere glutathione delivery. So now looking at our product system for doing this, uh, IMD is kind of our flagship product. This was the first main detox product that we brought to market uh, at the urging of Dietrich Klinghart. Uh, and this is for opening up phase three transporters and stopping reabsorption. So this is opening up the doors down into the small intestine and binding things once they get down to the intestine. Now it's important to recognize IMD not just as a passive sort of catcher down in the gut, but it really, in our detox system, it really be becomes uh, one of the main gas pedals and one of the main modulators of the intensity of the detoxification. Uh, there's a very active component of IMD, probably because we had to go through several different carbon-sulfur ratios and got one that, uh, that has a lot of activation principle on the whole uh, intestinal system. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that I've seen on the linking of the uh, liver to the small intestine and how the glutathione system seems to be controlled at a small intestinal level rather than a liver level. So IMD for opening up phase three. Phytonutrients then, clear way cofactors are our uh, main uh, that's our main formula for upregulation of phase two enzymes. So this is getting the intracellular phase two enzymes, glutathione S transferase in particular, uh, producing heavily inside the cell. And this will also bring with it uh, multiple intracellular antioxidants. This is a really fascinating part of the puzzle is how uh, you can trigger whole families of genes to turn on it at once. So we've opened up phase three, we've turned on phase two, and now we're going to deliver substrates for phase two uh, in, in the form of nanospheres. Nanospheres are, are sort of advancements of, uh, of liposomal delivery. And in this format, we're going to bring in glutathione, we're going to bring in a vitamin C R lipoic acid product, and an EDTA R lipoic acid product. Uh, I, just, I showed this uh, in, in our first run, and we're going to look at this uh, probably a few more times. And that's the importance of titration of doses in this. Uh, if, if you don't 
dose correctly, you're not going to get the correct response. If you start too quickly at too high of a dose for the individual, and you'll find the dosing is fairly individual, or at least the, the starting point and the rate of increase is fairly individual. But if you don't, if you start too high, you tend to detox them too fast and you know burn their fingers, and then they're they're nervous about going on with more detox, and so that's the starting period. You want to start below the the you know the base doses and make sure they're okay with things. Uh, if you start with homeopathics in what we call a pretox period, that usually uh, makes this initial period much easier. But then you have to work your way up. You have to keep increasing the dose, increasing the dose until you get to a period where you're at least triple what the base doses uh, are recommended on the bottle. So for IMD, uh, the base dose is 100 milligrams, but we'll often start people on half of that just to make sure that they're okay and they're not detoxing too quick. But you're going to need to get them up to a point where they're doing triple of that base dose. You'll need to keep them there for a few cycles. And when you get to that very high level of dosing, that's when you really stimulate a revolution inside the cell. That's where you really start to overexpress the detoxification system, and that's where you purge everything out of the cell and really get a new start. So if you either start too high or stay too low, both of those uh, are going to uh, keep your success uh, to a mediocre level. Start it, you know, keeping it too low will, will get people who are really sick out of the woods and it will get them functionally better, but it won't get them all the way back. That's what getting to these high doses is. So I just want you to remember that uh, while we go through talking about everything. So back to IMD now. Uh, IMD, the purpose here is to use the intestines instead of the kidneys for metal removal. The, the intestines have, uh, what do they say, about a tennis court uh, worth, of, uh, uh, worth of area in them. They regenerate very quickly, uh, and so it's, it's a better playground for, for moving a lot of junk out of the body than the kidneys. The kidneys have, have less surface area and very slow to re generate they're very intolerant of uh, of damage and so pulling a lot of metal through them uh, as in traditional uh, chelation therapy can sometimes be tricky uh, these are non-absorbed silica particles saturated with strong thiolic binding groups so they're small silicon dioxide particles like tiny grains of sand and we have covalently bound what look like fatty acid chains to them and at, ter at the termination of the fatty acid you have a thiol group. Thiol groups are uh, the strongest elements for binding mercury uh, and so you have saturated these now so they will bind mercury very tightly. There's so many thiol groups there that they're not going to be releasing the mercury. And they're covalently bound so that the, the uh, sulfur groups are not going to come off of the silica as they go through the intestines. So now everything that comes down to the gut will be bound up, including the metal that is accumulated in the small intestines, small and large intestines. And that is one of the large accumulation areas of mercury. And ironically, uh, this accumulation of mercury actually slows down the transport systems that's supposed to be detoxifying it. So if you're not sweeping it away from the transporters, you'll actually gum them up and slow them down. Uh, as I said, that uh, bind uh, mercury in the intestines, make sure it gets out of the bodies. And what we see is an opening up of phase three transporters. We see elements that need phase three to work but aren't related to thiol binding. Uh, we see those go down in the blood at the same time that mercury is going down, meaning that we're working on the whole transport system at once. And of course, since this is binding everything that gets down to the gut, this is going to stop enterohepatic circulation, which is the reabsorption. Uh, in the case of mercury, or in the case of methylmercury, uh, enterohepatic circulation, let's see if we have a, I think we have a graphic of this coming up, uh, but let's go back to this one. So uh, I'll talk about enterohepatic circulation in a second. Uh, just to go with the slides, 
we want to correct this phase three elimination. We've bound up and stopped this whole movement out, and we want to open this back up. We want to get that, uh, that whole system flushing down and out of the body. And uh, with phase three enhancement, uh, we, we've seen that bilirubin, which is, unreg which is unrelated to glutathione, it's not bound to glutathione, and it won't bind to, glut to thiol resins once it gets into the gut. But we see that bilirubin falls very quickly, too, during treatment. So uh, this is a slide from some Hal Huggins uh, work, and he had people in the seven to ten day intervention taking IMD uh, during an amalgam revision, and he saw levels going from two down to 1.1, 1.7 down to 0 0.9. These are very big changes, anywhere from uh, 23 to 47 percent in this short period. Well, now why would that be? And if, in fact. When he presented this to me, he said, Chris, this stuff really works really well on liver function. And, and I said, liver function? What do you mean? He says, well, I use Billy Rubin to track liver function. So I started charting out. In fact, that's where this uh, graph came from or this diagram. I started charting out all the pathways uh, for detoxification. And I found that glucuronic acid is what's bound to Billy Rubin uh, via UDP glucuronic and glucuronosyl transferase. And so it wasn't binding to glutathione, but when all of these different phase two uh, roots have to go out, they go to the same transport protein. So if you block any of these transport proteins, you block all of these different roots. And conversely, when you open up these transport proteins, you open up these roots out. So uh, by acting down here on the small intestine with IMD, we were affecting the glucuronidation pathway. And so that, that's a very good thing to see. And so that's one of the active uh, aspects of, of IMD is, is getting this whole system to spin at a higher rate. And what that means then is it's not just the uh, mercury conjugates that are coming out. By, by uh, movement into the glutathione system, it's not just then the other thiol reactive metals like uh, lead, cadmium, arsenic, antimony, those aren't the only ones coming out as well. But you're affecting all of these different pathways at once by opening up these transport proteins. So this is the reabsorption uh, slide. So this was this reabsorption of, of methylmercury is typically what happens. And the reason that happens is that uh, the body is removing methylmercury as a glutathione conjugate, and you can think of glutathione conjugates as hitting the doors out. And if you remember back to the absorption of methylmercury, methylmercury was absorbed uh, as a cysteine conjugate. So when you digest a piece of tuna fish you ate, you're left with methylmercury cysteine, which is a molecular mimic for methionine and thus is absorbed through amino acid transporters in the intestines. So once it's found and bound to glutathione, it's kicked back out as a methylmercury glutathione conjugate. Now the problem is that gamma, -glutathione, uh, gamma glutamyl transferase, an enzyme in your biliary tract and intestines, uh, will break down the glutathione back to cysteine, and then that will come back in uh, and be absorbed absorbed with 95% efficiency, just like it was in the beginning. So now if that methylmercury glutathione comes down into the gut and you've got IMD in there with its thousands of thiols per uh, silica particle, that will get pulled into all those thiol groups, get bound up, and get brought out all the way out for excretion. So it's important to cut off that uh, re recirculation pattern. So now we can move the weight of the detox back towards the intestines by interrupting and uh, opening all the flow there and, and uh, stopping the reabsorption. Then we can take a lot of weight off the kidney. And incidentally, a lot of people uh, say to me that IMD helps their kidney function. If you remember that graph of uh, or that uh, schematic of, of how blocking up the, the intestinal root out transfers extra weights to the kidneys, then you can 
understand that. IMD is only working through the gut, yet it's taking a lot of weight off the kidneys, uh, so, so they're not working so hard. So uh, this idea of a, a thiol resin has been used before. In fact, that was used uh, back in the 1970s, uh, except in this case it was a polymer resin. We used uh, silicon dioxide. I, I got the idea to use this approach after some functional medicine uh, lectures that I went to with Bob Roundtree, and he was talking about the uh, effect of the dendritic cells in the intestines and the antigen presentation system, how they react to things going through your intestines and decide whether they're happy or not happy with that. So instead of using a polymer that's like polymerized toluene, we decided to use uh, silicon dioxide, which is something that uh, the human intestines have been looking at uh, since they've uh, since they've dawned on this planet, and so we found that it was something that was a lot uh, lot happier for the immune system. In fact, you can try uh, polythiol resins, which are still used commercially, and muscle test people on them, and they muscle test very poorly versus uh, uh, IMD with its silicon dioxide carrier. But nonetheless, chemically, the polythiol resin was used in the, in the 1970s. So this was a polymer with thiol groups on it. It was given orally to interrupt enterohepatic circulation. This was done during a uh, poisoning in Iraq, and we've, we've, we've looked at uh, one slide from that, looking at the half-lives of uh, elimination from the body in different people. Also, that what came out of that uh, poisoning was uh, the use of this thiol resin. Uh, and what they found uh, in, in this particular test here, this was on mice, they found that it, they cut the half-life of methylmercury in the body from 60 days to 20 days just by working from the gut. Now, a lot of people then will say, all right, now if you're working from the gut, what are you working on? Well, you're working on the blood directly. A lot of these, you know, most of it, uh, you know, the majority of it is probably coming through the small intestine, uh, through the liver into the small intestine. But there are transport proteins all along the small intestines that can directly drain uh, into the intestine. So you're working on the blood. Then people will say, well, if you're working on your, the blood, how do you know that you're working on uh, on the tissues? And well, it turns out uh, certainly for methylmercury is a very uh, what's called a one compartment toxin. It redistributes from the blood to the tissues and from the tissues back into the blood very rapidly. Inorganic mercury is much slower in its kinetics, but it still does redistribute. And and uh, so this is a look at uh, a dosing to the uh, mice in this study and then a look at them 42 days after a single dose of methylmercury cysteine. And so you can see the blood from the control group to the experimental group goes from 94 to 13. So that was about a seven-fold decrease in the amount of methylmercury in the blood. Now what do we see when we go to the organs? Well, we see the brain going from 400 down to 67. This is another close to seven-fold decrease, uh, maybe about a six-fold decrease there. We see the kidneys going from 949 down to 131, so there's another seven-fold decrease in the kidneys. And the liver we, go, we see going from 560 to 55, so that's over a ten-fold decrease. And remember then the, uh, the file rest since are, are working and drawing very strongly from the liver, and so you see the, even the strongest effect at the liver. So you see by working on the blood, we're working on the whole organ system. Uh, the, again, the idea was to interrupt enterohepatic circulation, as I said, cutting the half-life from 60 days to 20, clearing the blood, and thus clearing the tissues. Uh, this is the quote. Uh, Berglund in Berlin had stated that the linear first order kinetics of excretion imply that methylmercury equili equilibrium between tissue compartments takes place rapidly as compared to excretion. So you're able to redistribute the mercury load 
from the organs into the blood at the same time that you're moving out of the blood. So for methylmercury, there's a complete equilibration. Uh, as I said, for inorganic mercury, it's a little bit slower. Thus, we really want to go in and, and stimulate the cellular mechanisms to more rapidly excrete the, uh, the inorganic mercury from the cells. And uh, this is a little bit of look at uh, blood to organ relationships. These were methylmercury feeding studies. And, uh, you know, because people will tell you that this is back to that myth that blood isn't a good indicator of uh, what's in the rest of the body. Well, that's kind of ridiculous in, in the weight of the, the data. Here is uh, blood total mercury to liver total mercury. Uh, in this feeding study, you see a very linear uh, relationship between the two. This is blood total mercury to kidney total mercury. Again, a very linear relationship, starting to break up a little bit at the high end, but this is very tight relationship. And then blood to brain mercury, again, a very linear relationship. And uh, this is from the Iraq poisoning. This was the use of the polythiol resin in humans. And this is very good because now we can compare this approach to uh, other chelators that we know and see how strong it is compared to them. So uh, in this, they took people who had been uh, poisoned uh, by eating the methylmercury treated seed and uh, they treated them either with no treatment or a placebo and uh, the half-life is there. Look, you know, between 60 and 65 days was, was the half-life there uh, for no treatment and then treating with DMPS shots, that was a very aggressive DMPS schedule, uh, they were able to get the half-life down to roughly 10 days. Uh, treating with the rev resin, the half-life was 20 days. Treating with N-acetyl penicillamine, the half-life was a uh, little less than 24 days. And treating with penicillamine, the half-life was a uh, 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 little less than 26 days. So you see the uh, use of the polythiol resin was better than the penicillamines and not quite as strong as DMPS. Uh, but you see still a very very uh, rapid uh, or really steep increase in the rate of depuration out of the body. If we look back, uh, this study that I'd shown a little bit of data from before about the half-lives in the body when I was talking about uh, the use of blood, uh, in this study of fish dosing, we're seeing 44 to 66 days half-life. Uh, and 160 days back to baseline. This is uh, use of IMD. This is, this, this is a look at a long-term use of IMD. You see the blood levels coming down, 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 down. Then here we have a single dose of a Chilean sea bass meal and there's a, a rapid increase and then I was able to uh, track the blood decay as it came down over the next uh, period of time using IMD and uh, liposomal glutathione. And so we were able to look at what the half-life uh, here was compared to normal half-life. And so uh, the half-life using IMD was now 17 days instead of the normal 46 to 66. And the time to baseline was 40 days instead of 160. So we see about a fourfold uh, increase in, in how fast we're getting mercury out of the body. Now here's a look at uh, natural attenuation after amalgam revision. And uh, this was a study, uh, this was a study of patients in Germany where they split a group of people and followed them for, for a year and a half. So this is really nice because a lot of uh, re research doesn't follow people long enough to, to really be meaningful. And in this study, they took the amalgams out of half of the group and left them in the other half. And they did speciation work on the blood so they could look at the methyl versus the inorganic mercury and see uh, how it changed in the blood over the course of a year and a half. And uh, what they saw, now the, the data is a little messy, a little hard to track the way that they laid it out, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll walk you through it. 
The most obvious uh, result here is people with no amalgam revision. This is blood inorganic mercury. You see it tracking pretty steadily along here uh, with, with no revision. Uh, and then when you have, oh, I'm sorry, down here, when you have a revision of the amalgams, take the amalgams out. Here are two groups with an amalgam revision. There's a two limb, a fast 90 day decrease, and then a slow decrease after that. So you can see the slower kinetics of inorganic mercury rapidly leaving the blood and then slowly leaving the tissues through the blood. Then when you go to methyl mercury, you see something very different and unexpected. Uh, here is the data for methyl mercury with no revision. It kind of jumps around a lot, but it essentially doesn't change. And then these are the two groups that had uh, amalgam revision. And what you see is that they actually go up. So when they took all the data and modeled it together, this is the trend of methyl mercury in the blood for no revision of the dental amalgams. And here is the, the, re, the revision group uh, model trend. You see that it actually goes up. So why would that be? Why? And uh, you know, typically I'll, I'll ask people in a, in a classroom setting uh, why someone would go up. And various answers would come out. People would say, well, you know, they didn't protect them. Uh, during the amalgam revision, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. Uh, the answer is actually different, and and the answer uh, backs up everything that I'm saying about phases of detoxification. And so, in this trial where they took the amalgams out but didn't treat the people, the methylmercury goes up over a year and a half. Here is blood from me after I had my amalgams out and uh, I've been taking IMD and you see the blood levels go down, 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 down very steadily. And I did continue to eat fish. I wasn't eating uh, very high mercury fish but I was eating uh, about what I normally would eat which was, which was uh, salmon. And the difference here is that when you remove the amalgam from the mouth, you stop swallowing corroded inorganic mercury. And that corroded inorganic mercury is typically going through the gut and affecting the detox system by creating uh, inflammatory states in the small intestine. What that does then is close the doors down to the small intestine that back regulates on the phase two enzymes and turns down the activity of the two phase two enzymes. So the whole system is down regulated. Then when you take away the amalgams, the phase three aspect is turned back up. Then the phase two aspect can turn back up as well. So the cells start dumping more mercury out of the cells. Now the problem then is that methylmercury goes through enterohepatic circulation and so a lot of this mercury that's dumped out of the cells and into the blood is brought down to the gut but it's reabsorbed. So in the study done in Germany, the cells are dumping into the blood but the methylmercury is being reabsorbed. So you see the blood levels in uh, the, the blood methylmercury levels going up over time. Now I'm sure you'll probably hit a hit a plateau where they'll, they'll flatten off, uh, maybe even go down. But here, when we're taking IMD the whole time and stopping the enterohepatic circulation, even though the blood is dumping more and more uh, of the mercury out, you're able to keep sweeping it out of the intestines. So this was this was a great study to find because it really graphically showed this response of the body to taking the amalgams out that the, the cells really do start to release more and more. Uh, so now look at uh, blood methylmercury levels. This was a small clinical trial that Hal Huggins did, uh, a 7 to 10 day in, in intervention with amalgam revision and nutritional treatment. And with eight people taking IMD, you see about a 20% decrease in mercury levels in the blood in the seven to 10 day, over the seven to 10 day period with uh, essentially no change in the people with no treatment. 
Now this is very typical that you'll see about a 20% decrease in the first one to two weeks and this will be followed by a much more gradual lowering as the mercury is starting to displace from the cells into the blood. So first you lower the blood levels, then the cells respond to that by increasing the enzymatic activity in the cells and increasing the dumping rate from the cells into the blood. And once this increases, then the, the rate of lowering of the blood slows down. So uh, a rapid decrease then a very slow one as you start to move out. In fact, in some people, you'll even see the blood levels come up a little bit if you speed up, uh, rapidly speed up how fast uh, things are dumped out of the cell. Here's a little look at uh, use of IMD in individual cases. This first patient here uh, was a very big fish eater and uh, she had quite a bit of buildup of methylmercury in the blood. There was a fair amount of breakdown of methylmercury and inorganic mercury in the blood. Uh, this person did not have amalgam, so did have a history of having them. Uh, she stopped eating fish and, and started taking IMD and did all of our products uh, very religiously and she was able to get a 70% uh, decrease over a three month period. So that was very rapid decrease. Now here's a person who did not stop fish consumption. The nature of where this person worked meant that they had to eat fish all the time. And even then, uh, you saw the blood levels decrease over uh, about a six month period. I saw him again, he had about a 40% decrease in uh, his blood levels uh, just by continuing to take IMD. Uh, along with his meals, and that was just by speeding up uh, his rate of release from the body. This was a, a patient, this was the highest patient, the uh, highest methylmercury level patient that we had at the time, and uh, we did an amalgam removal, and this person they also had very high inorganic mercury levels, and then put them on a full protocol. You see a 30% removal in two months, 80% removal of methylmercury in six months, and 90% removal of inorganic mercury in six months. Uh, after about a year, this person was down from uh, where they started close to 20 to under one uh, nanogram per mil. And so it's very, it, it's very possible to bring these levels down quite a bit. This is just uh, a, a quick product comparison, just to give you an idea of where we're at with IMD. Where we're combining, we're trying to combine the chemical specificity and efficacy of a pharmaceutical chelator by having thiol binding groups and combine that with the safety and uh, the more natural mechanism of uh, a natural compound like zeolite or chlorella. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Dietrich Klinghart calls chlorella everything I, uh, well he calls IMD everything I wanted chlorella to be. Uh, and so now he uses this as his main uh, neurodetox and uh, cornerstone of, uh, of uh, all the metal detoxification. But areas of action, we're trying to use the intestines instead of the kidneys, uh, and that's the same for zeolite and chlorella, work on the body by working on the intestines. We have mercury specific binding like DMSA and DMPS do, yet we're not using the kidneys. We have a high margin of safety by not even being systemic, just working from a gut level. Uh, we have high efficacy by having thiolic binding like DMSA and DMPS do, and you end up with, with low risks. Uh, your, your demineralization risks are low. I mean, you, you still have to respect it the way that you respect anything that's got a good trigger for detoxification. You have to uh, start people slow. You have to make sure that their systems are adequately prepared. And you still do want to remineralize uh, as we do this drainage out of the body. You're resetting a lot of the mineral levels. Mercury is notorious for displacing uh, the zinc in the body and filling up the zinc, what should be zinc stores with mercury stores. So you are going to want to uh, load in all of your good minerals at the same time that you're draining out all these bad metals. So 
Now we move on to the phytonutrients, and this is really a fascinating uh, aspect of the system. Uh, this is where we're trying to upregulate synthesis of phase two enzymes and intracellular antioxidants inside the cell. And this goes back to uh, that uh, notion or, or that model I was giving you of the antioxidant detoxification protein repair super system. And in that model, there is a pool of antioxidants that are used by the cell. But the antioxidants aren't really the, the most important players. The more important players are the enzymes that, that uh, are in the periphery here of, of this system, the enzymes that are putting each one of these antioxidants to specific works. Uh, as I said for glutathione, you have an enzyme that uses it for peroxide quenching, glutathione peroxidase. You then have an enzyme that regenerates it because you oxidize glutathione when you do that. You have glutathione reductase regenerating that. You have an enzyme for fixing protein damage, that's glutaredoxin, and then the enzyme glutathione reductase for regenerating the reduced species. You have an enzyme for binding glutathione to metals, that's the glutathione as transference. You have uh, a protein, a uh, transmembrane transporter for moving the mercury glutathione conjugates out of the cell, that's the uh, MRP1 to the OATP. So it's, it's probably more important to focus on getting this enzyme system up and running than it is to think, well, I, I, I need more vitamin E now. You need all of this stuff, but being able to trigger these enzymes is, is more powerful in its ultimate effect. Hello, guys. Howard. Hello. Circles. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, uh, in the circle stage, we were talking about the central pool of antioxidants and all of the enzymes that really make those uh, take those antioxidants into their different functions in the body. So, if you don't have the activity of the enzyme systems, you really don't have anything. And uh, so the area of, of work that we're going to use here is called phytogenomics, phyto being plants, genomics being gene expression. So using plants to uh, regulate gene expression. And uh, so it turns out that certain phytochemicals can upregulate phase two enzymes as well as the production of intracellular antioxidants like glutathione and superoxide dismutase. So when you're doing this, you're getting plants to activate what uh, is sometimes called the anti-inflammatory cascade. And these plants that we use to do this are often well known for being anti-inflammatory. And that's because what they do is, is trigger an activation of a protein inside the cell that goes into the nucleus and upregulates transcription of a whole family of genes uh, just when you think that biochemistry is hopeless, hopelessly lost in endless mechanisms and levers, you find this one master switch uh, for turning on all of these good players at once. And uh, the plant compounds that do this are ones that we, we use a lot and we think of as being good for detoxification. So there are polyphenolic antioxidants, things like green tea extract and pine bark extract. And then there are sulfur compounds, uh, things like alpha lipoic acid, which is what we make the most use of. But very famously, the whole crucifer family, so uh, sulforaphane. Uh, all the different aspects of the broccoli family, and garlic oil. And we'll talk about why people think about uh, crucifers and garlic oil as being uh, chelators, when they are in fact not chelators at all, uh, but glutathione is the chelator. We'll talk about how those things work. And the point here is to bring up that whole enzyme system to make the most use out of your antioxidants. And so the way that this works, uh, this is uh, called a chemoprevention. Uh, and 
this works through a mechanism called the Keep One NRF2 signaling pathway. And so this is inside a cell. In the circle here is the nucleus. Outside of the circle is the cytoplasm. And on this actin polymer here, you'll see this protein pair here, Keep One and NRF2. And what happens is certain plant chemicals trigger these uh, dithiols to, to link together into a disulfide bridge which changes the conformation of the KEEP1 protein. And the NRF2 protein is then translocated into the cell. When it's inside the cell, all genes that have a certain promoter region, the promoter region has the antioxidant response element. Obviously, these are going to be genes for antioxidant response. And those genes turn up production then of phase two detoxifying enzymes, intracellular antioxidants and modulating enzymes, and uh, what are called molecular chaperones. So all of a sudden, all the machinery for taking junk out of the cell is activated at once. And so you can detoxify uh, electrophiles and free radicals and lead to cell survival. Now, interestingly, you can find all of this research in the cancer uh, magazines. This is mut mutation research. You look through carcinogenesis, you'll find lots and lots of papers on this specific pathway. And it's a wonderful pathway for turning on all the good guys in one fell swoop. So the polyphenolics, again, we want this anti-inflammatory cascade, upregulate there are phase two enzymes through uh, these nuclear receptors and transcription factors. One of the things I really like about the polyphenolics is the vascular protective effects to strengthen the capillaries and improve oxygen delivery. When you're moving metals through the body, you have a lot of potential damage to the vasculature. One of the most uh, uh, encouraging aspects of being at the uh, Global Mercury Symposium in Halifax a couple months ago was that there has, since the last I think since the last conference of its kind, and certainly over the last three, four years, there's been about 10 different major papers that have come out showing the negative influence of mercury on card cardiovascular health. And uh, a lot of this is due to uh, damage that's done at the epithelial level of the vasculature. Uh, and I, I mentioned some of that in the beginning where you're tearing apart membranes to get mercury off of thiols uh, in the cell membranes of the epithelia. So strengthening the vasculature at the same time you're moving the metals is a very important thing. Now these are all uh, thought to be anti-carcinogenic because you're moving uh, the mutating chemicals out of the cells. And in fact upregulating the system like that uh, is, uh, there was, well, there was very good work done on breast cancer where they saw that estrogen free radicals were uh, responsible for a lot of the mutation that was going into breast cancer. And upregulating this detoxification system was able to normalize that by shuttling the estrogen free radicals that were created in phase one out by increasing the activity in phase two. Uh, and then the other aspect of these, uh, these compounds is that they cross the blood-brain barrier. And uh, I'll show you a picture of all the detoxification mechanisms at the blood-brain barrier. So what are the polyphenolics that we're talking about? Well, there's epicatechin, that's the monomer and oligomeric proanthocyanidins, as you know from pine bark extract or, or grapeseed extract. This is what's in green tea extract in cocoa. Uh, so we get a lot of use out of epicatechin and its, and its various polymeric forms. Elagic acid is from, coming from pomegranates and from various other fruits like strawberries. And quercetin coming from fruit and vegetable skins. And of course, you know what I'm going to show you next. You didn't know what I was going to show you next, did you? Uh, maybe you did, though. I don't know. I've done this enough now. Uh, why am I showing Medicine Buddha? Why is he up here? Well, he's holding his bowl of long life elixir, and I can uh, only imagine what that is. But I know what this is. This is uh, this is the healing fruit. This is the myrobalan 
or terminalia chebula. And if we look more closely at what is in the myrobalan, uh, this is also known as harataki, you'll find, uh, you'll find a, a winner's list of uh, all the polyphenolic antioxidants. And we can only assume that Medicine Buddha must have known this. But here you find elagic acid, you can find uh, various uh, things that are like epicatechin, there's luteolin, there's gallic acid, epigallocatechin, chebulinic acid. And uh, what we find in this particular plant, when uh, I think I'd, I'm trying to think back whether I'd shown this study, and I think I had. Uh, in this study, they took young and old rats and watched what happened to them as they age in their antioxidant system. And in their antioxidant system, you could see liver glutathione going from uh, 10.6 down to 8.7, vitamin C going from 9.1 down to 6.76. Let me see if I got a slide. Yeah, here we go. We see anywhere from an 18 to 37 percent decay in liver and kidney antioxidants just with age. When you go into the enzyme systems, uh, glutathione, uh, glutathione reductase, glutathione S transferase, you see these going down 35, 37 percent, G6, G6 PDH going down 50 percent just with age. You, you see uh, one of the things that comes in with it age is also inflammation. You see this whole export system just sort of drying up. And when they treated these rats with an aqueous extract of harataki, they saw all of these numbers uh, go back up, or at least go back to their, their normal youthful range. Because one of the things that happened was catalase and glutathione peroxidase, instead of going down, they went up. So what you find is your native antioxidants, the things that are supposed to maintain the cells in a highly reducing state, these go down and then the enzymes that have to deal with uh, neutralizing uh, hydrogen peroxide or uh, lipid peroxides, those go up. So the fire extinguishers get more active because you're not preventing fires anymore. So then when you treat the cells with the aqueous harataki, you find uh, all of the antioxidants go back up, and the, peroxidase, the glutathione peroxidase and catalase go back down. So everything goes back to its normal reducing milieu. And the levels that they used here were not really ridiculous. This was uh, corresponded to uh, about six grams of, uh, of the raw material for, for an adult for you know, a 75 uh, kilogram adult. And that's what we based uh, our dosing when we use Harataki and Clearway cofactors. Uh, so all of the enzymes went back to the regular levels. And uh, you see here the liver glutathione going down from 10.66 to 8.74. And when you treated them, it goes back up to 10.67. All these levels here are almost identical to, uh, to the young rats. Though, if you treat the young rats, the levels go up a little bit, but there's nowhere really to go because the body is already at optimal functioning uh, when it's young. So all of you, you old rats in the audience out there, you've got to get some Harataki in you. <laughs> I, <laughs> you don't like being called old rats? <laughs> okay. So... Now, going back to uh, this picture of the half-lives in Iraq, uh, we saw this. <clears throat> we saw the outlier groups here, very slow detoxifiers, and then we saw moderately slow detoxifiers. So, our our function really here is to help these people who are not very good detoxifiers move over and be faster detoxifiers. So, we're talking about ways that we can support this system. We open up the, the transport proteins and, and get those moving very fast. We upregulate the uh, expression of, uh, of the antioxidant enzymes in the cell. And we're going to uh, increase, the, uh, increase the levels of the 
uh, of the substrates for the antioxidants inside the cells. Uh, so we talked about poly, uh, polyphenolics. Now we're going to talk briefly about sulfur compounds. Hey, Mark, uh, how, how long do you want me to go today? Well, um, you want me to wrap up? Yeah, if you can wrap up, because you obviously have a whole lot more to get into. And uh, maybe it would be, uh, maybe if you can wrap up, then we can ask some questions. OK, um, good. Uh, okay. I'll just show you. I got two slides on the sulfur compounds before we go uh, into looking at uh, nanosphere delivery. So we'll just stop after. Now, the I would like compounds. you to really focus a lot on that nano delivery, you know, because there's going to be a lot of questions. Excellent. Okay. Good. So uh, now sulfur compounds. Uh, it's the same thing as the polyphenolics, anti-inflammatory cascade, upregulate phase two. They've got vascular protective effects and anti-carcinogenic effects. Uh, and this is the one that uh, probably has more uh, study on upregulating phase two. Uh, we ended up more with the polyphenols because we found that people who were mercury toxic seemed to respond better to them than the sulfur compounds. The sulfur compounds are a little bit irritating. Uh, but everybody talks about, I'm sure all of you have heard when people talk about the broccoli family, people will say, well, they're sulfur compounds. They chelate the mercury. Or when people talk about uh, garlic, they'll say, well, they're sulfur compounds. They chelate the mercury. But when you look at these, this is sulforaphane, the most famous uh, of the broccoli seed extracts. This is arucin. Uh, this is allyl isothionate. This is uh, isothiocyanate. This is oil of mustard. Uh, this is wasabi right here. You see all of these sulfur compounds, none of these are thiols. These are isothiocyanates. These do not do chelation. And then you get to al allicin. This is uh, a very odd uh, sulfur link here. And none of these do chelation. But what do they do? They they stimulate your glutathione system by activating that genetic pathway. That family of genes get upregulated. So in fact, they are not the chelators. You are the chelator. Glutathione is the chelator. You're activating that system when you're taking these sulfur-based compounds. Uh, and then here's more of uh, this is sulforaphane glucosinolate. This is what it looks like before you enzymatically break down the, uh, the glucosinolate into the sulforaphane. And incidentally, uh, the way this happens is enzymatically in the, uh, in, in the plant when you crush the plant. So it's good to very finely chop the crucifers and eat them raw, or to chop them finely uh, before you cook them. Uh, here's another one that's, that's well known in the cancer world. That's indole-3-carbinol. That's not even sulfur-based. This is more like a uh, polyphenolic. Uh, and let me just see what else is in here. I'll just talk about uh, what's in clearway cofactors, and then we'll pick it back up from there. And so we have uh, large doses of B vitamins, uh, just a few of them. We have B1, B5, and B6, because these are really crucial uh, for your detox pathways. I don't do B12. B12 is very individual in its dosing and its needs. Folate, similarly. Some people need a ton of it. Some people don't need quite as much. Uh, selenium, 200 micrograms at the base dose. You'll get a little bit more of that when you're when you're dosing higher. But selenium is a cofactor in a bunch of these antioxidants here. Selenium is not a chelator on its own. It's just the mercury knocks out uh, the glutathione peroxidase and, uh, th uh, and uh, uh, thyroidoxin peroxidase. And you need to give more selenium to support that. Then in the proprietary mix, we've got the harataki. That is the medicine Buddha herb. We've got dandelion. Uh, to keep the uh, bile flowing, uh, Bacopa moniera and Gatu Cola to stabilize the mind stream and help with neurological detoxification, bladder rack for minerals and iodine, uh, just enough to, to keep you going, plus uh, the seaweeds have a protective effect uh, against metals as well. Natokinase, we've got a healthy amount of natokinase to break down uh, biofilm development in the gut. You're not going to be able to get the gut to work right until, you, until you've worn away some of those uh, accumulations in there. Pine bark extract and quercetin round out the polyphenolic uh, aspects. And then our lipoic acid. Uh, our lipoate we'll talk about more when we talk about the vitamin C. Our lipoate 
but R lipoic acid is much stronger than alpha lipoic acid uh, because that's the biologically available form. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to cut it there. We'll talk more uh, about this in the nanosphere delivery when we uh, come back next week and uh, take any questions that we have now. Um, one question with the IMD. Uh, I, I asked you this before, but I'd like you to, with all of the, sulf, um, all of the thiolic groups on that, how does that, uh, what evidence do you have for or against of, of, of uh, mineral, um, uh, the good minerals being bound? Uh, the, the thiols, now, when you're doing DMSA or DMPS uh, chelation, you've, you've got a couple different mechanisms of binding there. You've got uh, ion exchange from the sulfonate group and from the carboxyl groups, plus you've got the thiol groups in there. And so uh, it tends to bind uh, a lot of different things at once. Those uh, sulfonate groups can take magnesium and calcium as well as being very good on, uh, on zinc and, ca and uh, copper. The thiol groups here don't have any affinity at all for calcium and magnesium and potassium. Uh, and their affinity for zinc is not a lot, not a whole lot more than, uh, than the affinity of an amine, like an amino acid is for zinc. And so we haven't seen it being real strong in demineralizing, but there is some action there. There is some in, in all the drainage, you do seem to need to demineral, uh, to remineralize, but we don't need to do it very radically. Uh, and, and I'm not really sure yet if it's just because we're resetting a lot of the mineral metabolism, uh, like uh, mag magnesium. When those phase three transporters that are moving the mercury glutathione conjugates out of the body, they consume magnesium. They're magnesium ATPases. So, so suddenly you, you, you're using more magnesium, you need more magnesium, but it's not necessarily because you're stripping it out of your food by taking the IMD with it. Uh, zinc, there seems to be extra zinc needs, but there's always extra zinc needs in mercury toxicity. A lot of that's because the mercury is filling up the, uh, the metallothionines, and the metallothionines are supposed to be filled up with zinc. Uh, just like ceruloplasm is filled up with copper and ferritin is filled up with iron. So when you start moving all that mercury out, you need to uh, rebuild all the zinc stores. But uh, as far as dosing for people, we've been, like if we use something like, uh, we often use pure encapsulations, mineral 650, that has a six capsule dosage. And during the days that people are using IMD, we'll have them take just two a day, and then in their days off, take six to eight, and uh, we've been able to keep everybody stable using that relatively minor dosing. So I hope uh, I hope that gives you some idea of where this uh, where it is with the re demineralization. So when you, I mean, when you just uh, could you do the similar thing when you just don't take them together? Yeah. Oh yeah, you, you, I mean we don't. We certainly don't take them at the same time. Uh, you, you'll take your minerals at at a different time of the day. Right. So you. But you there does, there, there seems to be a little bit of mineral support needed, but not a lot. Okay. And then, what kind of side effects do you get when when with your patients who are detoxing too quick with the IMD? Uh, it's usually, I mean, it's pretty standard stuff, it's usually fatigue, uh, can be headachey or, or just some general malaise. Uh, sometimes it's gastrointestinal, they'll be gassy. And usually if you just back off the dosage a little bit, uh, it's fine. So those are, those are the general symptoms, uh, fatigue being the most general. But then there's also sometimes retracing symptoms and those are more unique. Uh, so there's there's general systems and, uh, symptoms and then ones that are very unique to the person, and again those tend to be retracing symptoms. Any constipation? You know it's a little hard. 
that occasionally happens, and then you have to uh, then you have to put them on more magnesium. Uh, and usually, just magnesium is enough to to get them moving again. You definitely want to keep the bowels moving. Though some people who have chronic constipation, this keeps them more regular, and uh, then other people who have chronic diarrhea, this keeps them more regular as well. So uh, it, it's it, you have to get some feedback from them once they start using it, uh, so you you know how to modify their dosing. And and then last question I had was. Can you simplify? You said when you took the amalgams out, the methyl mercury went up in the blood. Can you simplify why that happened again? Yeah. The methyl mercury uh, is dependent on the glutathione system for uh, for moving it out of the out of the cells and into the blood, and then the transport proteins for moving it from the blood into the uh, intestines. At that point, though, it's reabsorbed. If you're not binding it onto something, it's reabsorbed. Okay. So when the amalgams went away, the irritation in the intestine goes away, and that whole system from uh, moving to the gut and moving from the cell into the blood, that was, that was held back before. Then when the amalgams were taken out, that was released. So that movement from the, from the cells to the blood increased. But because once it gets to the gut, it's reabsorbed, the movement out of the blood was not – well, it, I mean, it might be moved into the gut and then back, uh, then absorbed again. But the export from the body completely uh, was not keeping pace with that – that change, that upregulation of dumping from the cell. It's a little, you, you have to see all these compartments kind of working together at once. Uh, so uh, the way I see that is an upregulation of phase two by removing this irritating effect of the amalgams. Thank you. Well, Chris, thank you very, very much. I will uh, try to get in touch with you today, and we'll set up our times, OK? And OK, then, very good. Two weeks we have you on here for the for um, the continuation. Yep. All right, man, my friend. See you later. Looking forward to it. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. And what I have thank you. we have to do is we have to institute his his IMD and his other things. Major things.